Awesome. So welcome to my talk, uh, which I have just renamed to upgrading to Java 17, crazy or crazy not to, uh, based on a conversation, a physical conversation with a live human. I know for some people that's shocking, but still, this is this is the thing. This is obviously JDD, and uh, well, if my calculations are correct, this is the 579th day of the, of the pandemic. Welcome. Uh, I go by Axe. So feel free to refer to me as Ax, or I, my full name is Andrzej Grzesik, obviously. Uh, if you want to drop me an email, ags at Revolut. If you want the slides, drop me an email. If you'd like to talk about anything at work related, drop me an email, happy to talk to you. Uh, naturally, even though I work at Revolut as a principal engineer, as I was already explained, my opinions and my views on technology are my own. I'm not representing any organizations here, I guess. Uh, you, I think, think you get the disclaimer. Uh, some facts about me. Uh, I am proud to have been called a Java champion. Uh, I'm old enough to have gone to Java 1 and then became a Java 1 rock star. I'm involved in Geekon when it's still organized and when it, when it will be organized. Uh, some uh, community groups uh, in Krakow and some other groups, which I didn't put logos in here. Bottom line here, I like working with the community apart from working at work. If you have any questions about the talk, drop them to me. Obviously, uh, I would ask you to raise your hands and, and shout, but uh, this doesn't work that well unless uh, you happen to be where I am. And I won't tell you where that is. But I have this very useful iPad next to me. And if you write a question there, I should be able to see it and I should be able to answer. If you have any questions about Revolut, talk to me after the presentation or drop me an email or tweet or anything. And and the usual plug that you would expect if you would like to work with me, I'm actually hiring. Yes, Rebel is hiring, but I'm also hiring for my team, which is going to look after all of the services that we have in Revolut and help us with that and global expansion, a couple of uh, other interesting areas. So let's start with a dry joke. And this is time for me to drink. I like using motiva motivational pictures, but I can never get a serious, a more serious one. Anyway, this would work so much better if we were in a room so we can pretend we're doing a show of hands because I guess somebody must still be uh, running Java before eight. That always happens, that keeps happening. Uh, from what I notice, uh, as I uh, talk to people, more and more people are actually leaving Java eight. Not too many people are online on 10. And that's actually good because uh, uh, nine or 10 are not supported. They are not being updated. Nobody's working on them. As in there are not, no changes happening to that. The, the binary has it, as it has been created, it's there on the internet. Some people use it, but they should probably upgrade. Uh, mo a lot, I won't say most, but a lot, a lot of people right now in 2021 are on Java 11. That includes me, that includes uh, Revolut, that includes uh, other friends that I work with and talk to. And some people are far enough and high enough that they are with Java uh, version higher than 11, which is uh, good, which is uh, awesome and expected. And hopefully this is going to, the trend is going to continue. Obviously today we're going to talk about uh, our migration path. So how we jumped from eight to 11, expect a short part of that about that. Well short to medium. And we're going to talk about uh, what is coming in Java 17 and why we already are planning the work and already have started some explorations for doing the Java 17 upgrade because that's an upgrade we will put in early. Now, we can say, we can see, well, the state of Java or the report that Relic has published quite some time ago, actually, because I think that was 2020, but, in that, at that time, you could see that version eight was definitely the king. Eight current, eight lagging, that takes easily over 80% of, of JVM versions. I don't have, I haven't seen a newer report like that or anything with updated numbers because that would be very interesting to read, but I can only guess. This has not massively shifted. Why am I showing you this one? Because it clashes with this kind of, those kind of polls. Uh, people asked on the internet will say very loudly that they are on the e version and then the actual numbers and the actual versions of JVMs used in production are sometimes different. And that's normal, that's okay. Since we're at JDD, I have to 
advertise to talks. One of them happened yesterday, one uh, by Jean-Philippe. Uh, it must have been awesome. I certainly haven't seen it because I scale very poorly. But uh, the one about production profiling with JDK Flight Recorder, I do recommend you watch it or I do recommend you watch the replay as soon as it's available. And today in the morning, there should have been a pretty nice talk about uh, garbage collector, which should have included some details about ZGC, which again, I'm going to catch the replay because well, life is life. But if you're curious about GC in general, that's probably a very nice one. Uh, the second talk, the Yagichawa garbage collector is obviously in Polish. So if you're an English speaker, sadly, but I hope the slides are in English there. Now, Java upgrades. The Java upgrade story I am going to give you is in context. It's in context of Revolut, so a real organization doing uh, a real financial organization, uh, one that has a production environment, that, that has engineers working on systems, and one that ha needs to have the systems that keep working and keep operating without any failures. Uh, you could say, sold as our company, and I would say, well, high five to that or another gesture of social understanding to you. Uh, what that meant to us at the time of the deployment. The applications that we, the way we used to run our apps were, uh, they were dockerized, they were running in CoreOS, which is now end of life and dead. And uh, there was a bunch of Docker demons on, on the machine, one workload or one principal workload uh, per, per VM. So if an application needed five instances, we would spin up five, uh, five VMs in total and so on, you get the idea. As I mentioned, CoreOS, it's a dead dinosaur. It's deader than Windows XP, probably. Or actually, no, because you can still find running Windows XP around, uh, like a tyr Tyrannosaur. Uh, this is wh wh where we started. And why did we decide to upgrade? A uh, couple reasons. Uh, reason number one was we like to move things or we would like to make things happen. As and it's, it seemed like a good idea and we wanted to do it, so we did it. Uh, another thing is we wanted to, we sh we have the attitude of, of moving fast and we want to keep things working because we're dealing with people's money. It would be uh, very bad if anything happened to that. So keeping production up is um, an obvious thing. Why? The, how is that relevant to Java upgrades? Well, very easily. Uh, we have to take the security upgrades in somewhere. And we either take them through backwards into eight or we take them from a reasonably recent, uh, currently developed version. We decided to go with 11. Another reason that's tied with that is we would have to upgrade at some point in time anyway, because uh, yeah, running a dated JDK, it is a choice for some people, but not for us. And lastly, we are very much engineering first, which means engineering is important to us, which means we want the new features when fixes. If uh, running JDK 11 two years ago or over two years ago helps us uh, convince uh, uh, good engineers to join us because, well, they want to work with uh, newer JDK, uh, hey, well, we're going to do it. That's easy. Uh, obviously, some people would say, hey, but those really good engineers also write in other languages, at which I can say, yes, we also have, uh, we also have Kotlin, we have a tiny bit of Scala, and uh, yeah, but we're primarily a JDK place. So one reason or one principal reason if, if you didn't, don't agree or not fully ingest all of the previous reasons that I mentioned is why should you upgrade? Well, meet this gentleman. Uh, if you recognize them, that's awesome. If not, allow me to introduce you to Jason. Uh, how is Jason relevant? Well, Jason is relevant in this very, very easy way. You have the class called Java Lang String, which everybody is very familiar with, up until Java 8 inclusive. Strings were, uh, strings internally were represented as char arrays, which means two bytes per character or more, which is awesome, but takes two bytes per character. If most of the stuff that you work with is JSON and ASCII, you're wasting bytes, obviously, as in every, almost everybody knows it once, once they think about the details. Uh, from Java 9 onwards, internal str string representation is a byte array. And for encodings, which, or for character sets that do not have any funky characters, that will actually be one byte 
equals one character because it fits, which means you're saving memory, which means uh, you are going to reduce your heat pressure, which means your VMs will require less memory, which means you can pay less, which is very, very nice. Somebody uh, very knowledgeable here could say, hey, but G1 could do the string the duplication. I would say, yes, it can. Yes, it's a workaround. It's not It's not going to be such a massive change as, as switching from eight to nine just for the string representation. But uh, yes, you can do it. Also, if you care about string, uh, string size, you might also run with a custom string implementation or a custom string cache. But those are engineering workarounds that you have to run and maintain, whereas this comes for free just for switching uh, Java to nine and upwards. And obviously, this makes a happy JSON. But yeah. Upgrade and ops in the context of Revolut. We do have we, we do love automation. Everybody says that. What it means for us is we we use infrastructure as code and developer take care of many infrastructure tasks, which means if a develop if development team decides that the application that they own and maintain needs more RAM, they will edit specific YAMLs, approve them, merge, and then redeploy and everybody's happy, their pods or their VMs at the time got more RAM or more CPU or more instances or whatever they need to, to make. Uh, DevOps or ops people work on specialized projects, which means somebody has to create those cookbooks and somebody has to ensure that it works with Kubernetes and VMs. Uh, this is what the ops team will, will work on. But then the development teams own, run and maintain the applications that they build. Now, the upgrade specifically that we did was uh, Java 11 towards from JDK 8 update to 1.2. I don't know if that's relevant to anybody, but just for the sake of archaeology, I did manage to find, figure out what, what version we upgraded from. And we did it to all the applications that we were running. Not, not some, not obviously not everything at, this, at the same time and overnight, but uh, eventually, uh, we upgraded all the apps. Uh, we are running Java 11 across the board right now. And uh, yeah, why not 9? Because it wasn't longer maintained. Why not 10? Same story. And they, there were no backwards. There were no backwards into a 9 or 10, uh, which means it's it's a six month uh, Java version, which then dies its natural death and 10 continues and so on and so on. And why not 12? Because it wasn't available and going to LTS seemed like a good idea. And this we were we did it and we were happy. Now, with JDK 11, there came a nice or an interesting part, which JDK should we choose? And we uh, decided, and we went not with Oracle JDK, we went with Open JDK, obviously, we, we, we've adopted Open JDK. Uh, why not uh, Oracle JDK? Because you remember that we run in VMs, which means we want to bake JVM into the image, which means uh, this is something that Oracle JDK explicit, explicitly in the license prohibited. Uh, we couldn't redistribute, whatever that meant. Uh, the question is, if I put my image onto uh, an image registry, is it distribution? And we would need a, a, a license to run it in production. And this is what made us use Open JDK rather than Oracle JDK, which internally are, it looks the same and it works the same. There is there is no difference. So that is just a licensing change that's actually relevant because it affects us. Uh, somebody could say, "Hey, now what's?" Uh, but with Java 17, you are free to redistribute. And I've uh, looked at the license, and this language looks. Like uh, if I were doing open source and I was charging absolutely no money for that and I wanted to just, just make it convenient for the users, maybe I could consider Oracle JDK. For anything that touches production for services that I would take money, I would first consult a lawyer, which is also my recommendation. If you want to take uh, draw conclusions from this license, consult your local lawyer because uh, I am not a lawyer. Uh, you will see that Java 17 has adjusted the licensing, but the ex exact details, I do not feel comfortable discussing in here because it would need a bit more time and a bit more attention to detail, which uh, I don't want to jump through. Now, Java from version nine was getting new release every six months. We probably all know that. Uh, three builds for each major version and then an LTS every six releases. Uh, 
that's a fact well known by everybody now because everybody <laughs> knows it well. Uh, which means this, the, the, the life cycle uh, is supposed to look something like that, which means theoretically, if your company is on one of the LTSs, you're happy. Uh, why this picture is still very relevant and interesting? Because Java version 8, even though it's still in LTS and it will continue to be in LTS, uh, Oracle commercial support is going to end in 2022, which means if you're still on 8 and you're paying Oracle, your, uh, depending on which contract you are, your support actually might be ending next year. I won't tell you whether those updates have changed because I stopped tracking GDK8 completely. It is possible they, have, they haven't adjusted, but it's a thing. And uh, for us, we wanted to pick a version that will have a bit more runway ahead of it. And also we will now be migrating to 17, as you already know as soon as it's practical. Now, the problem with this picture, apart from the exact date of uh, when each version is going to be maintained until, well, you get the general idea about how the longevity of a version, but still, that recently, Mark Reinhold has blocked, uh, and the link is down there, I hope you can see it. If not, don't worry, you can email me for slides and I will happily share them with you, that the release cadence of Java is not fast enough. What is being proposed is that an LTS release should be should be happening every two years and compare uh, as opposed to what is the current standard which is uh, every three years so 11 to 17 that's six versions if this goes through 17 plus 4 becomes 21 so java 21 would be the next lts is that going to happen i don't know that's a proposal but you can expect some discussion and you, you probably want to voice your opinion if you have one uh, on the subject because it is quite relevant and it represents a very interesting compromise that uh, Java makers, Java developers, not as Java developers, but the people who actually work on Java uh, have to make between uh, shipping features and uh, the community catching up. Because yes, community catch up, the fact that not all of us are on even on 11 is, is a thing. And this means that there is more maintenance and so on and so on. Now, when upgrading to Java 11, but it also, the, the, the picture, the, the number uh, for Java version can be replaced to anything. You have basically two options. You can compile and run on the, your target release, or you can decide to take a more staggered approach and uh, compile on the old version of the JDK, run it on the newer one, and yeah, you will benefit from the newer runtime as well. We uh, went with option number one, as in we, when we are upgrading Revolut, uh, everything runtime and tool chain was uh, running newer Java. Sometimes that is not possible. Uh, sometimes you will be held back. Sometimes you might have tools that are not fully compatible. Sometimes you will have a, a funny situation and it's absolutely normal and expected to use Java 11 or use, I don't know, Java 13, use Java 16 for some tools, for some areas, only for runtime. and while they have been compiled by another Java version. Java has this notion of compatibility that some other scripting languages might not sometimes fully support, but Java has it because they, that's the way the platform is, uh, is, is run and governed. Uh, and this usually works. When could that have been the case? When we were looking at Java 11 upgrade, those are the, some of the tools that have uh, maintained on their release notes or official uh, websites that they are not fully compatible with Java 11, which means the normal way to run and move forward is compile them with eight, make, well, generate whatever you need to make with Java 8, especially if you had Drift or anywhere inside and Hadoop is a, it's, its own special place uh, in hell on, but on earth. Uh, they were held holding people back and that's, that's normal that was happening and running different components with different Java versions, well, depending on how they, uh, they communicate. Uh, given the size of the ecosystem that we run with, this is a normal situation. This situation has somewhat improved because people have caught up and newer Java version uh, have uh, been caught up with. But that means that most of people now default to 11. Uh, 
And the same situation is going to continue with 17. So if you, for example, want to try 17 and want to use 17 for some applications, because I don't know, you're passionate about ZGC or you want to do something else, uh, you're welcome to, even if you compile it on 11 before. That's normal and that's a normal uh, way to go forward. Now, build tools. Two things that I should mention because they will be useful if you have to go through the migration. Uh, one is approaching more, one is uh, showing module dependencies and that includes uh, internal API usage. It became useful to as a figure out what's happening when you were upgrading to 11 because it would show you what's uh, not going to be valid as you go forward. But it becomes even more so valid when talking about 16 and 17, which strongly encapsulates some internals uh, from the JVM and some access will not uh, no longer be possible. Uh, it's a tool that you might want to use if you want to scan your applications and see how bad the situation is. Uh, they are available as plugins for Gradle and for Maven, which means you can put them as a, as a build job or you can define it as a build job and just run all of your applications through until maybe if you want to approach migration until nothing shows up as, as red. And similarly, uh, you can use JDepper scan for scanning of deprecated APIs. As you will see later from the list of JEPs, uh, so Java enhancements proposals that went into various uh, JDKs, uh, there is a number of deprecated APIs that you might uh, want to migrate of. Obviously they will be well advertised, but what uh, became the first uh, surprising or monumental event in the Java ecosystem when Java actually removed some APIs now becomes a normal fact of life. Security manager is deprecated for removal and so on and so on. Things and code is going to and will keep disappearing from the JDK because it's no longer viable, it's no longer applicable. Um, nobody uses applets anymore, which means it's a thing. If your software uses some of those esoteric APIs, or you think you might be, there is a tool that gives you the sanity and uh, safety, and you can scan your code base if you are using any of the potentially infringing APIs. If you are, even if, if they are still uh, marked uh, as deprecated for removal and they are still there, you at least know that you have some work to be planned and you need to figure out your own migration path going forward. Or maybe you want to talk to Oracle and uh, try to convince them that this is not the, the, the right way because I don't know, your reasons might vary. Might vary. Now, if we want to compile modern uh, Java, Maven makes it very easy. You take the latest compiler version, which is Maven compiler plugin version, which is actually 3.81. You declare source and targets and everybody's happy, everything works. But Given a lot of people use Maven, uh, there are two plugins that I feel I have to mention because still not too many people know about them. Uh, one is called Versions, and it has a very useful thing called Display Plugin Updates. Display Plugin Updates, as you can probably infer, displays plugin updates available, which means if you have a long litany of product plugin versions, if you're POMS, then maybe that's going to give you some uh, ideas what to upgrade and then you can try to upgrade and uh, when this list becomes shorter you're happier. Uh, similarly to that, if you need to upgrade your dependencies, this uh, same versions plugin has an option called display dependency updates which can scan the dependencies see if there are up later versions available and it will suggest whatever, whatever whatever is the option. The choice is on you, the developer, to make the upgrade or you can try to ask Maven to do that. Uh, but at least you will be able to figure out how many libraries are you behind. Uh, why am I mentioning this? Uh, two reasons. Whenever there is a JDK release, there will be uh, maintenance or fixed releases to most of the popular libraries because there are bugs. Software is, well, written by humans, which uh, despite the best intentions and a lot of expertise that they have, uh, they will be sometimes surprised by the changes brought on by a new release of the JK, JDK. And maintenance releases to, I don't know, for example, JUnit are, are a normal thing because there will be some bugs uh, around things that change in the JDK, which need to be addressed. And the, the, this is something that's normal when you are going to go for a JDK upgrade and it will stabilize and everybody is going to be happy. Uh, Gradle, uh, if you want to go to 11, V5 and V6 for Gradle is good. 
uh, v7 uh, is, is also awesome uh, v8 is most likely going to be awesome as well if you need to upgrade gradle go one version forward at a time uh, it's just going to be less uh, less surprising because well things things break we did uh, we were uh, on gradle v5 when we were upgrading java so we were happy right now we're mostly in gradle 7 so we're still rather happy uh, as i said upgrade one at a time and since I started mentioning 17 casually, uh, the logical follow-up is what about Gradle and J Java 17? Well, the problem is that it's going to be in 7.3 RC1. Uh, and you can also see on their GitHub picture has been taken today in the morning. So it's a reasonably fresh screenshot. Uh, 7.3 RC1 is still uh, a bit delayed. Uh, so Gradle does not have a release that you can download normally from, from the website. Uh, that with all the blessings uh, supports uh, Java 17. You can try to, uh, to to make it work with, well, you can try to, to take an older release and make it work with Java 17. Sometimes it might, sometimes it might not. Uh, formal support is coming. It's a sh short way around. Uh, of course, you're more than welcome to take uh, recent sources, build them with 17 and use, use it like that. And uh, yeah, this is the situation that always happens when there is a, such a major change in the JDK. Uh, Mokito, some facts about Mokito. Uh, they've started formally supporting JDK 11 and version 220.1. Some of the releases that included uh, JDK support in the release notes were list, are listed here. Why do I mention those, those versions? Not that you should re recognize them or memorize them, but even though some library might announce compatibility and formal support for JDK version X, does not mean that the work is done. They will have to do backporting. They will have to do maintenance fixes because people will discover bugs as massive adoption is, uh, takes place. It's a, it's a fact of life and it happens. From our perspective, we just upgraded when Mokito had those problems and we were, try we were doing some workarounds whenever we encountered any bugs because we did. Uh, it's not that bad but don't expect it to be a completely smooth ride if you want to migrate as early as we uh, want to. Obviously, I encourage this because the benefits uh, clearly for us outweigh the, the, pay, the, the price, but still. Juke, same story, uh, official JDK 11 support in version 3.12. Uh, we were on 3.13, so we were happy. Uh, JDK 17 support is coming uh, in 3.15 and that's a commercially available release. Uh, the way they uh, handle that, uh, if I read the comments correctly, is that uh, there are new APIs that use the record API uh, in Juke that are just not available for, for the open source edition just yet. Uh, rest should work. Uh, I won't say that everything works because we haven't migrated everything, but it's, it should probably be okay. Another fact, or another interesting framework that I will mention. And that's an outlier because uh, uh, why? Uh, Flyway officially supports, uh, J supports JDK 11 since version, since version 5.2.0. But uh, normally you move forward. We actually encountered issues and we have moved back to version 4.2.0, which turned out to work with JDK 11 quite okay. And then only later we upgraded to five point something uh, branch uh, all the way to five to four. This is this is not a normal path of, of an upgrade, but it also might it also might happen because it it, it worked, and if it works uh, well, works uh, trumps playtest or anything else because yeah, we love working software. Uh, obviously, tiny detail about Java eleven. Uh, Jep three twenty Jaxby code gen was taken out, so now you now need to declare it as an explicit dependency. And uh, since that, you have to add it to your dependencies, then it's there. Uh, language support. Uh, I mentioned we have some other languages than Java or than just Java in Revolut. Uh, Groovy, which we use for Spock. Uh, we, have, we had to wait for, for it to upgrade Groovy and this just worked. Groovy. 4.0, which is currently in beta. And if Andres is looking at the presentation, he's most likely going to cheer for Groovy because he's a huge fan of Groovy, is uh, expect to support Java 17 uh, in the 4.0, which is again in beta, which should come in shortly, but I won't make any promises for the Groovy team. But our experience with past Groovy migration, once they enabled support, everything was, everything was uh, awesome. The problem with, uh, 
groovy and why it's also important is because Gradle is has a very tight relationship uh, with Groovy naturally, which means unless or until Groovy announces uh, full Java 17 support, probably Gradle is going to be a bit delayed, uh, which is normal and expected. But yeah, Scala, uh, Scala is uh, an awesome story because it just worked, it just switched versions of Java under the hood and no issues there, just that. Uh, some compatibility no notes about uh, Java 11 and modules and Scala, but rather than I'm talking about modules, I'm going to show you this. Scala is already looking forward to supporting Java IT. This is very forward looking. And this means that if you are looking at Scala, you're probably in a very good situation if you are using one of the latest language versions. Kotlin, uh, since version 1.3.30, uh, supported new JDKs. Uh, we upgraded, everybody was happy, no stories there. Now, dependencies. How do you actually go about an upgrade? Naturally, you're going to have a situation when A, or de a depends on B and B depends on C, and it's an onion, it's a, it's a chain, whatever you want to call it. No blocks there, though. Uh, what can you do? Uh, in our case, it was an application that de depends on alpha, which is a library that we have internally, and that relies on commons. Uh, what we, how we actually went on with upgrading is make the application, so the uh, think that depends on everything, but is not being depended upon by, by code uh, to comp make it compile using version 11. We tested it with 11, but we were confident that the tests are passing. Uh, we started to run it with 11. And then we started to compile the more inner layers of the onion using 11. And you get the pattern. And that's it. Uh, Bouncy Castle for 8 to 11 migrationists. There, there's a slide for you. I won't discuss it because it's old time. It's, it's ancient future. Uh, the thing that naturally has changed from 8 to uh, 11 is uh, VM options. Uh, one useful thing to know is uh, GC logging has been unified. If you're behind, you might not know about it. If you're not behind, you know about it. Uh, in short, what changed was how you tell the JVM to log GC details. Uh, what should you do about it going forward? Well, I would say you should look at this tool called Chacoline Dev. It used to be on the internet when I last checked. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, to inspect your command line. It can give you hints about what you need to change if you have options that are, I don't know, very dated, very legacy. And uh, uh, yeah. Useful tool, especially if you want to be told uh, with some text about what versions, uh, what what options to use or what, what options not to use and why. Uh, it might also tell you that you have something uh, illegal, which is very, very nice. And also, since I'm talking about VM options, I have to mention this awesome website. There is a combined view of all the VM XX options available on a, on a very cool website by Chris who codes, and I have a link to that as well. Uh, so grab the slides for it, or you can just uh, look, uh, Google Chris who codes, and there is a JVM hotspot uh, flag reference, which includes which JDK, which architecture, what's the meaning of it, what's the default, and what's the relationship. It's probably the best resource in terms of documentation that I've seen. Uh, wholeheartedly recommend. Tiny details, zip file does not use does not use mmap to map. Da da da. Doesn't matter. What matters a bit more is time precision. Time precision between eight to eleven has increased because of this jab. And actually, yeah. What, what? How does it affect you? It doesn't affect you directly unless you expect a certain procedure, precision or a certain representation of time uh, with, uh, with what Java gives you. Uh, you can read about it in uh, Joda Stephen uh, block, which is how Java 9, to be precise, has uh, increased the precision of the timer available. If the supporting operating system has a timer which has more resolution, you might get more detailed uh, time output. Awesome. What's the consequence of this? The consequence is very simple. You will get a different string representation, which means if you mock or if you expect certain timings, uh, 
do have only three digits, now they might come in six. And it's a might because if the underlying platform does not have the resolution, it, they will not. So you have to be careful. And that's all going, I'm going to say. If you have tests that actually expect specific things to happen within a specific time limit, you might need to adjust your checking logic. Now, what is the recommendation about this? The recommendation is have your own time abstraction always so that for testing, you control the precision and you can make the adjustments because if you rely on system, well, instant now, local date time now, anything now, that just calls the operating system uh, logic or the GDK logic, you do not give yourself a layer of injection that you could utilize to manage this all centrally. And GDK 11, gloriously goes on and then we encounter a bug when bugs happen and bugs uh, happen and then you have to figure stuff uh, well figure out workarounds they happen in formatters they happen in compilers i'm not going to go through the details because they there are links to those bugs the uh, some of them refer to generics and you can see there are some workarounds that we figured out and we just apply them to the source code and lived happily uh, one point i which I will make a pause for a while is uh, like with G1 as default because GDK 11 defaults to G1. Uh, everything was great, everything was fine. Uh, G1 that JDK 11 provides is a different G1 that JDK 8 provides. Also G1 that JDK 13 provides is a different JDK that, it's a different G1 that JDK 11 provides because as new JVM and JDK releases are pushed out there, upgrades to the code base of the garbage collector are also included in them. So naturally, if your G1 experience was suboptimal in JDK 8, it's going to be much better in, G in 11. That's it. Now, how was our life with G1? We have had no problems with, with GC. As in literally, we could stop taking any GC logs and we would be, we would be comfortable and happy. We don't have problems there. Uh, full GCs are multi-threaded, so no long pauses for us. No magic to run human perception pauses. Uh, we don't have problems because of that. We just kept increasing heap sizes. Our heap sizes are usually up, uh, up to 32 gigs for most applications, and it all works. Uh, I wholeheartedly recommend uh, for things that are human uh, or machine-to-machine -machine, uh, services talking uh, talking to each other. One caveat here: we don't run high latency, high, high low latency, uh, or latency sensitive software. Or the latency budgets that we are dealing with are quite uh, big, so they are expressed rather in, in a second as a second, not uh, tens of nanos. So we didn't have to worry about that, and we're not uh, affected by it too much. What another thing? Uh, faster out of memory failures. So if your G1, if your system is going to run out of memory, G1 uh, enabling G1 made our systems crash earlier, which is useful because we, we have just adjusted. Uh, what do we see here? Out of memory GC overhead limit exceeded. We've not seen that anymore. It will rather crash, uh, which is much preferred because if you have to wait 90, 95% of, Time to pass uh, or 98 as it's at, as it is in the default, uh, you will see a failure much earlier. So you win because you restart your application earlier than later, which means you do not have a problem later. Memory appetite, uh, I think that I mentioned that already. So da 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 da. da. Well, we, you can imagine now a demo of a live deployed to Oracle Cloud to so that we can compare how JDK 8 and JDK 11 how much memory uh, they take. Uh, I will save your time and I will save your attention. Uh, the conclusion is the resident size of Java 11 process would be higher than that of Java 8. This is what we have observed. This is what I kept observing. For So what it meant for us for a fixed container size, we had to decrease by a tiny amount the XMX and XMS. And we would get faster OOMs if something didn't play out. So that was a very fast and uh, very short activity, very pleasant. Imagine if you had to uh, adjust it and then failure started to happen a week down the line. That would be a nightmare. That wasn't the case. Now, language features adoption. Obviously, the big thing is VAR. Uh, this is a project, random one, over a scope of a year, as you can see. People loved VAR because it's less typing. And, and at first, there was a bit of caution. Now, it's, uh, now it, people just 
apply it everywhere and we're very happy with it. I stopped uh, going through uh, the statistics as uh, after a year. Another thing, as of nine, release nine underscore is a keyword, which is a bit unfortunate because if you have been programming, for example, in Scala and our underscore is very useful, but what can you do with this? Well, you can do this, you can do double underscore. And that works. And that solves the exactly same purpose visually. It's almost indistinguishable. Well, Java Flight Recorder and Mission Control, there was an awesome talk about it, hopefully mentioning event streaming. And the talk was by Jean-Philippe. Instead of me speaking about that, I will re redirect you to that talk that already has happened. So you have to rewind time and watch it yesterday. Now, what is next? What is next? For us, obviously, I already said it in the very beginning, for us, the next step is called 11 to 17 migration. 11 to 17 is going to take quite a lot of features and pro potentially a bit of a bit of time again. Uh, we expect it to be, what, probably two months uh, of uh, not, not uh, dedicated work, but roughly uh, this is the amount of time it took us to migrate. And uh, let's have a look at what JAPS, so Java Enhancement Proposals, went through various JDKs and see which one affects us or which ones might affect you. That, that's a question to you, obviously, and I will not be able to say that. But JDK 12, nothing that interesting from a software engineer point of view. Useful uh, changes to G1, abortable mix collections, lower latency. And returning unused committed memory from G1, which means uh, lower overall system pressure on, onto memory. JDK, JDK 13, if you're doing uh, class data sharing, so you have uh, many JDKs, but many JVMs running on a single operating system, you're going to use it. Uh, otherwise, probably not much. JDK 14, now this is a really, really good one. Java Flight Recorder, event streaming. I already said it, so I'm not going to say it again. But there are also helpful null pointer exceptions. Helpful null pointer exceptions are literally this. Instead of saying null pointer and giving a stack trace, it cannot, it, the JDK will say cannot invoke whatever the method was because which variable was null. Uh, they were off by default in JDK 14. And they are on by default in JDK 17. If your software sometimes suffers from null pointer, especially if it's if the line is convoluted, you know how helpful this is this is uh, going to be. Another important thing to notice about JDK 14 is the removal of CMS. I will let that sink in and check if there are any questions. Uh, so CMS does not affect us because we're running G1. And I see a question from Michal, do you use Javax I have uh, have you migrated to Jakarta? We're actually we actually have tiny bit of Javax, but we're not using Java EE that much. Uh, we're using uh, our stack is is not a typical EE stack as you would expect it. So no, I would say not no affected. Neuralink doesn't support Java seventeen. Uh, yes, that's a very good comment, and there is. Uh, that that is related to to what we want because uh, obviously we need monitoring to work out, uh, and uh, we are talking with uh, New Relic because another limitation that I found around New Relic is uh, you can use uh, Java Flight Recorder event stream with New Relic, but they don't support custom events, and I would love uh, us uh, to be able to use that. Uh, how long does it take uh, to migrate? I would say two three months of uh, one person working on it. Mm -hmm. I won't say all of the time, but but one person uh, taking ownership. Uh, we expect similar workload right now. Let us go through the some of the interesting uh, other changes, and I will keep peeking at the questions now. Uh, JDK 15 uh, removes Nashorn. Uh, if you're using Nashorn, uh, you will have to get it from somewhere else or do something about it. And JDK 15 also introduces uh, ZGC formally. And it introduces text blocks. Text blocks, if you're coding in other languages, you know the feature and I love the feature already. It comes with limitations. In Java, it can do this and only this. Uh, it's a multi line string. XML, JSON, anything else that use, needs multi lines, I don't know, SQL statements. Uh, 
it's a very good uh, place and thing to use that. Uh, doesn't come with uh, rendering of variables in the saddle. JDK 16 migrated to GitHub. Hmm. Here, here is a screenshot of GitHub, uh, which means JDK 16 has migrated to GitHub, which means you can support, you, you can fork and you can uh, try to interact with that. You can use it through Git. You don't have to use the, the funky mercurial uh, infrastructure for it. Uh, nice thing with JDK 16 is pattern matching, for instance, of that's included. And another awesome thing is records. Records, so Java Lang record, is a built into the language way of defining value classes. So for people who swear that they cannot code and they will not leave home without Spring, Hibernate, and Lombok, uh, they lose part of the reason for uh, for using Lombok. Obviously, Lombok does so much more and probably is so much better than just records. But for the majority of the code that needs to generate hash coding equals an accessors, uh, you just need to write public records and you're done. Now, what's under the hood? This is under the hood. The difference between a class uh, that has a constructor and a hash code and an equals is, is this, uh, that Java will generate the correct things for you. Obviously, it is a bit cumbersome if you want to have multiple constructors, but then you, you can use probably a static, a static factory and you will be fine. The good thing is you don't have to write the boilerplate. And if you don't have to write the boilerplate, you will not make mistakes in the boilerplate. If JDK generates the boilerplate for you, you are going to win so much more. And then we're going to mention one important thing, why JDK 17 upgrade might actually be split into 16 to 17, sorry, 11 to 16 and 16 to 17, because to strongly encapsulate JDK internals by default is the feature that actually kills or stops or is a hurdle to everybody upgrading. And it will be to us a bit because we're users of body for, for example, Mokito or other uh, areas, uh, JDK internals are being more and more encapsulated. And uh, what that means is accessing unsafe, obviously there is a workaround. So that's, that's not really a, a, a big change there. But what is a big change is if you want to use reflection on internal uh, JDK parts, it's not going to work. If you want to use methods come sun, it's not going to work if you want to use some parts of the JDK that you're not supposed to access. The JDK is finally going to start, start saying no. And it's going to start saying no in a gradual way. So there is a difference between 16 and 17, but you can see that in 17, uh, this thing is actually happening again. And this, is, this might be the only reason, or this might be the reason why we will stagger this migration into a 216 and 217. But if, if, Anyway, our intent is to fully go 17 if luck permits before the year ends, if luck does not permit it uh, early in, in the next year. So yeah, one last thing, sealed glasses, awesome thing, but I think I'm running slightly behind time. So I will skip the picture of a sealed glass, but I think I will. I can make another talk about that. Uh, now, if you have questions, uh, the important question is slides with links, drop me an email. I'll be very happy to talk to you. How do you get the colors and the IDE? Uh, there is a plugin for it, which is called Rainbow Brackets, which I like. And there is a semantic uh, highlighting that you can enable in IntelliJ. It makes it very colorful, but I like it. For me, it's useful. The question that is going to happen is performance. Is Java 11 performance uh, much different than 8? No, not much, just slightly better. Uh, G1 is a real blessing. Not having full uh, full stop the world uh, pauses is, is awesome. And now another question from the chat. How about all of those legacy monoliths? What do you think about transforming it to distributed monolith, which is an anti-pattern, to migrate as, very, as much as possible to new Java version? I can only say it depends. Maybe it might be easier for you to refactor everything as a, within a monolith because it's only going to be a single application, or if you can split it into a distributed part, maybe uh, as in, I would say, let's chat in details uh, outside of uh, the, the, this public channel that's also recorded. Somebody is probably thinking, did we do modules? Do we intend to do modules? Still not. Uh, our applications are independent. They talk via REST or via events or via database. Uh, we don't get the added benefit of, of having modules as in we don't collocate the elements of the application to a single JVM. So we 
pretty much are, are rather happy and then we try to make the client stuff as very explicit so we we might but we don't have a direct need for it benefits from byte strings so that relates to performance that relates to the to the change in internal string and presentation was it was it big was it big it was significant it was significant but it was uh, almost immediately taken over by traffic that keeps increasing uh, and uh, a question that probably somebody's thinking okay which jdk are we using we're naturally using open jdk and uh, yeah i think uh, uh jakub knock knock i think this is time for you to jump in Hello, Susie.